Hey, welcome everybody. Hello. This is podcast number 10. Dennis Young here. Hope you subscribe to the channel. Uh, we're having some great guests here and another great guest, Tim Summer. Thank you for joining me today. It's my pleasure, Dennis. Really. Uh, so, uh, Tim, I know you're from way back in the 80s and, you know, you've been such a big fan of ours. I can't thank you enough. Well, for... Liquid Liquid were such an extraordinary, absolutely unique band. I think the... Uh... The formal and or Latin term would be sui generis, I think. Or... I don't know how to describe us. We were yeah. just unique. Yeah, you were incredibly say. unique and you played with energy and joy. And I think it's an enormous gift to be able to do distinct, unique music. Thank with Energy and joy. It's one thing just to play it and be like a little artist standing in a corner. Liquid Liquid got on stage and you just were just this cyclone. It like was happy energy was it, it was and it was yeah. an intense energy even yeah. the reunion shows i mean it was even more intense i thought because it was nothing were, remotely remotely like liquid liquid which is why even though i was just a uh i don't even think i was in my 20s at the time even though i was a teenager at the time i wanted to hmm. do everything i could to be at every show and tell as many people as possible oh thank you i know this magical and, band and that article was fantastic. Thank you for that, Val. You know, the best bands that nobody's ever heard of. Because we really, we, we, we are kind of like this enigma. I mean, if people say white lines, and then I tell people and they know who we are. But we're still kind of in the, I mean, musicians know who we are, maybe, and musos and the dance scene. But the average person out there, I don't think, really knows, which is kind of interesting. Well, that happens. You know, that right. happens. You didn't do it to have people. Uh, this is the thing about great art rock, great rock in general, great art rock specifically. You can't do it thinking 20 years down the line. You have to do it exactly. for the joy. Dennis, you have to do it for the joy you so we feel did. within the moment. And uh, of all the bands that were around during that period, uh, very early Sonic Youth played with that same abandoned. I don't think Sonic Youth, when you would see them in 1982, for instance, um, I don't think they were thinking 20, 30, 40 years ahead. I don't think they were thinking of their legacy. They probably thought they were doing brilliant and innovative things, but I don't think they were thinking about what people would be thinking 40 years from now. Right. I think what they were doing was the same thing as Liquid Liquid, which is thinking, my God, this incredible joy that we are experiencing on yeah. stage and this communication with the audience, that was what why they were doing it. I think that's why you were doing it. And we were in the right place at the right time. We had nine nine records that's right. we linked up with. And then uh, Ed's brother, Bill, uh, was a DJ at Arras, I think at Danceteria. So yeah. he was spreading the word about us. So that really helped. But no, you're right. We didn't think, I didn't think definitely passed a couple of years. And then to go into the dance market, yeah, I mean, I we were basically I thought in an alternative band doing kind of post punk things. Post -punk well, that's what clubs. I thought you were doing too. I linked you more, even though I thought you were superior to these bands. I linked you with what was going on in England. Bands like a certain ratio, and Pig Bag and Early right. Water. Um, to use uh, Rip Rig and Panic, I think were a band that you probably had a lot spiritually in common with. Um, yeah, I definitely thought of you as a post-punk band and an extraordinary one. I did not, there were other people who were making the link with dance music. For instance, uh, as you know, and I think this is a fascinating part of this story, Dennis. Yes. As you know, one of, um, and a very early supporter one of Rick Rubin were the Ballmans, was Ed Ballman in nine. I know, yep. And I'm quite sure that I used to, and Rick was a close friend of mine at that time, 1981, 82, 83. And uh, he, was, he was paying attention to what Liquid Liquid were doing. And I think in his head, he was making the link between what you were doing in dance music. More importantly, he was making the link between what the Ballmans were doing and what Nine Nine Records was doing and dance music. I think an entire subject for an entire podcast, Dennis, would be what Rick Rubin learned from Ed Ballman in Nine Nine Records and Bill Ballman. 
I tried to get him on. Now talk about synchronicity. I have the poster in back from that show. Look at that. From Liquid Liquid, Treacherous 3. I know you can't see it that way. Yeah, well. I can see it a little bit. Right? Yeah. But that and that show was a bomb. Uh there wasn't a lot of people that showed up. And uh it was just a it was a great idea at the time at the diplomat hotel, this old hotel. It looked like a ballroom we were playing in. And Rick was in the back, had these dark glasses on. He was still in college, I believe, at that Well, time. you know that I lived in the same dorm as Rick. That's how we became friends. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. Small world. Wow. Um, but I think that's an extraordinary moment, an unheralded moment in New York music history is I think what Rick achieved, and by the way, I told this to someone recently, of all of the well-known people, of all the people that I knew before they were famous, who subsequently became successful, um, Rick is someone that I have zero unpleasant things to say about. How about that? I think Rick has moved forward in his career with kindness and with credibility. And I think that... Uh, you know, I, I just, he's, I, he, you know, I think his artistic and spiritual mind oh, yeah. has always been in the right place. Now, what I was mm. going to say is uh, New York City has always been a place of micro scenes, Dennis. Okay. Meaning 40 years, when people look back at 40 years, people look back at New York City in the 1970s and early and mid-1980s. I think they tend to lump it into one big mess of Play-Doh. Play-Doh. Right. They don't realize that it was five, 10, 15 different micro scenes. There was this stuff going on on St. Mark's Place with Club 57. Right. There was this stuff there. Going, around, yep. going on in a little underneath, un, literally underneath McDougal Street with 99 Records. That's right. There was Ooh. this stuff. There was the artsy side of the hardcore scene, which sort of influenced Sonic Youth and the Beastie Boys. Mm -hmm. There was the loud, very visible side of the hardcore scene. There was the dance scene. There was the drag scene. There was the gay scene. Mm -hmm. There was the graffiti scene in the way it, mm -hmm. the graffiti scene interacted with you guys as well. Um, right. All of these things acting, maybe they were separated only by one thin wall of brick somehow all made up music in the early 1980s. And it's an extraordinary picture. It is. What an yeah. extraordinary era. I mean, it, and, and there was so much energy. I could remember going on stage at one in the morning at a place like Chase Park. Right. And the energy level was so intense. I mean, it was just the people were really into be going out, dancing. I mean, we were part of why people went, but the other part, they were there. To dance, they were there already. And Ed, Ed had a real way of knowing. He just, he just had the pulse on what was happening. I think. I mean, I. We we can discuss this a little now. We can discuss this another time. Okay. Um, it, whatever you want. But I mean, Ed was a genius and he was a visionary. I think he was as important as the people as someone like Tony Wilson at Factory Records or Rick Rubin. Right. And again, the 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 fact that he helped start Rick Rubin's career is very significant. Um, and the part that I was going to say, I, you know, you don't have to discuss this now, is right. was Ed, what stopped Ed? Was it his di disillusionment about what happened with Liquid Liquid? Right. Well, I, I don't have the full story. I heard, you know, Ed was trying to sue and then they got, they went bankrupt, Sugar right. Hill. But I, it's been a lot of reports. I don't really... I don't really know the full story, but there was something involved with money, of course, money. And, and and I guess he was trying to sue or something, and he just got fed up. And I guess he went out of, didn't have any more money left. And uh, actually, we had the last record on 9-9, nine -Nine, Dig We Must. Okay. And yeah. that's never been reissued, but that was that was it after that. Um, fortunately, Liquid Liquid's music is now generally available through reissues, I hope. You make uh, you, that was licensed through you guys, and you make some money off of that. I hope so. Well, well, we do have licensings now for U.S. and other places, so we are getting some money, thank goodness, from yeah. all this. But uh, it took a while, and you know, I, I, I'm at awe that 
40 years later we're still still being played but it's the music can, now when i hear it it's still for me it sounds unique yeah i don't know how we came up with this stuff but we just had this certain chemistry um sometimes the best uh best music and the best artistic music comes when people won't stop themselves meaning they don't say well we're not supposed to be doing this we're not supposed to be using bass guitar as a lead instrument um let's put it this way dennis can you think of any other band of the era that had a marimba player no i don't well maybe frank zappa <laughs> right yeah uh beyond that i don't think so i think yeah. i was very unique in that point and when i met richard mcguire in in college i only had that marimba for a couple of weeks and i'm i was originally a drummer and then uh he had this jam at at the school and from there i got into the idiot orchestra and then eventually with the band this with liquid liquid what school was that dennis uh rutgers okay I, but it was a it was Sorry. a unique uh course it was called sound through tape tell me more about that it basically was uh, a, a gentleman who was uh, Sam uh, Daniel Good. He was into like gamelan music and all, all types of John Cage. He was into so what he had a big gigantic marimba uh, moog. And what we did, all we did was splice tape together, these different sound collages, and we got credit for it. It was the most amazing class. I mean, it was great. I enjoyed it, and he was a very unique guy. One of the first things he showed us was the silence um uh score you know the four four minutes and some odd seconds of 4, 433 right yeah so that's, that's where i hope that there's still at major universities whether it be Rutgers or nyu or wherever i hope there's still people with that sort of uh, uh professors with that sort of creativity i really do and i came from uh you know i we had a store by us called cheap thrills and the nice great thing about that, they had a lot of European cutouts at the time. So for $1.99, I was getting can records, Von de Graaff generator, gong, you know, all this great stuff. And that kind of influenced me when I joined the band uh, to influence them on my sound and, you know, where they were going. I mean, I think for anyone either listening to this or finding out about Liquid Liquid for the first time, probably the easiest point of comparison would be say well it's somewhere between can and, and gamelan music right so well, maybe you're right um let me ask you a question which sure. I, I wonder if you've ever considered of all of the things that were influenced by liquid liquid and obviously liquid liquid had an enormous impact on the culture if nothing else through white lines and regardless of all right. of the crap regardless of all the negative aspects of that, you have to put that aside sometimes, Dennis, and just recognize the extraordinary, powerful, ex wide cone of influence you had via white Thank lines. you. And you have to say, you know what? In many ways, that was a negative experience for it, but put aside the negative and just think about the positive influence white lines had. Now, having said that, I'm wondering, if you've ever considered something else, I think was very, very influenced by Liquid Liquid, which was, I suspect, something that was very influenced by Liquid Liquid was Blue Man Group. Maybe. And you've have you ever thought about that? No. Have you ever spent any time with just the musical aspect of what Blue Man Group did? No, no, I did that. Think of their the way they used percussion the way even they use just percussion to play melodies. If you were to just listen to what Blue Man Group do musically, uh, and I know, for instance, uh, the musical director of Blue Man Group, the bassist Larry and the stick player, Larry Heineman, I'm positive Larry was familiar with, with Liquid Liquid. I'm I'll sure. have to ask him. I think it's an interesting story. I love them. I saw them uh, in New York uh, off Broadway. They were great. I mean, and did you did it occur to you at all when you were seeing them that you were seeing someone who could be influenced by Liquid Liquid? No, I, for for some reason, uh, we never were influenced. I, that name never came up. That group or none of that. But you know, a lot of Fela came up too. Right. Fela was really a, a big influence, especially on Sal Principato. 
he was really a big fail and that Sal still doing music so which is great to see but I think some of that Afrobeat things that were happening and uh, public image right uh, there was a DNA and all that flux together can you know sort of made that thing happen right and between that it was just as I said forgetting about the negative stuff that happened when you talk about the early 1980s in New York City I think probably I won't say it's the biggest part of the story but in many ways the best part of the story is nine nine records and you were oh absolutely of, absolutely yeah. and even though now we say even though it did have a short history that history is etched in stone in that era so it, the records he put out were just great i'm speaking to uh pat place next week really yeah so i'm really excited about that see what she has to say about everything i mean it was an extraordinary you know, it was a time when we were discovering, and I say we very much so, especially considering, you know, I, I formed a band in 1984 that I think was definitely influenced by, by, by Liquid Liquid, especially by the way Richard was using bass guitar. Uh, the band right. I formed, Hugo Largo, um, and I say formed, I formed a band that was very much a four, oh, okay. a four headed animal. I mean, my collaborator, it was an equal collaboration, though I started it. Um, as a bass player, Richard was a tremendous influence on me. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, he was a great bass player. I had never seen anyone play bass player like that. I know probably there's a little bit of Holger Chuke in there and other things, but just the way it was just... The bass, more than any element in that band, seemed to drive the melody and the rhythm. It did. And then we had this extraordinary drummer, yeah, Scott Hartley. I mean, I I've never played with a more powerful drummer. And the unique thing about Scott is, um, we would go to these tours, and he wouldn't bring his own drum kit, and he'd get on these kits that I can't the house imagine. Kit. Yeah, I couldn't imagine playing. Yeah. I had to have my own drum set to feel comfortable. Damn, he sounded just as great. So that's a big big thing for Scott. He was him and Richard were such a driving, you know, force in that band too. Right. Both of those guys. I mean, but I think what I was getting at is there is a place, and whether it was what the Bush Tetris was doing or DNA was doing um, or what Sonic Youth were doing or Live Skull or the Swans, there was this aspiration to meet noise with simplicity, with art, with punk and in britain that came to be a very powerful you know that came to be the post-punk movement in the united states it was a little more uh you know a little more disparate in, because it didn't quite have the media attention that it did in england um but it was really as as you've and i know this is one of the intentions of this podcast it was really an extraordinary moment in time it was I, I felt it. I mean, you could feel it in the uh, crowd and the ba other bands we played with too were great. And I loved Gang of Four. I think now, when they first came over, they were right. fantastic. Ah, oh, that guitar, Andy, Andy was incredible. Yeah. And and even even their early clips at Arad, they were hitting cans, they were hitting things, you know, to make sound. And that's what it really seemed to be about. And that's why the marimba was more or less like a a uh, lead guitar instrument at times yeah. where I had to play a melody of some sort. I mean, do you uh, think that you were the only, you know, Caucasian post-punk band to really bring Gamelon into the picture? Maybe. I don't know. I mean, uh, I know, as I said, Frank Zappa was doing it with in the seventies and I'm sure there's other bands that were, that were doing percussion like this. But not to the level of intensity like this. I mean, we right. were we were a driving force at that time. Even the reunion shows, every show was was intense. You know, I looked at that set list and I said, "Holy smoke! This this looks pretty. <laughs> this looks pretty rough." Especially yeah. when we got to, to push. You know, and but we we pulled it off. That's what really is another 
great thing about the band. We never, it was never for me, maybe for the guys that maybe showed that they didn't like or, but I never thought it was that bad, even, even when we were not as good as, you know, we thought we were. So, and the audience, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't see it because they just saw something very unusual. Well, I think there were some certain people, I mean, I couldn't have been, I, certainly I wasn't the only person to be so swept off my feet by Liquid Liquid. Well, one, there was one person who didn't like us, Robert Criscow. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't remember that. Oh, yeah. Every time we did a, um, a show and he'd say who was playing for that week, he'd never, never say, I didn't think so anyway, anything positive. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he was caught in the old school, you know, rock and roll. I don't know. But I don't think he ever could understand us. Yeah. What's your opinion of that? Uh, you know, my feelings about Chris Scow is I began writing for the Village Voice in 1980, I think. And Robert Chris Scow was very good to me. Oh, that's good. Well, that's and good. He was an extraordinary editor. He could look at a piece of paper and look at your work and know how to make it better. Oh, and great. It's one of those situations where I judge Chris Gow based on his very positive and personal, positive personal interaction with me. Now, interestingly enough, there's a song about that. I don't oh. think you know that. This is no. This is not an unknown story. How you know, about other, that? You know, other people hearing this probably may already know the story. Um, so let's look at 1981-82. I'm writing for the Village Voice, and as I said, I have a very good relationship with Chris Gow, um, because of he is very encouraging of my work, and oh. he's a okay. very very good editor, and I learn a lot about writing from him. Now there. Are, other New York musicians like yourself who do not respond to Robert Crisco as well. One of those musicians was my friend Thurston Moore. How about Youth. that? Sonic Youth and Thurston did not like Crisco, and I guess Crisco was very negative about Sonic Youth in their earlier days. I don't know the specific instances of that, but um, so in 1983, 1982, I don't remember the exact year, uh, the exact date. I'm very positive about Chris Gow. Thurston, who at the time is one of my closest friends, we would go to shows a lot and we were just, we were very good friends at that time. Thurston um, is very negative about Chris Gow and I think he was very amused by the fact that I liked Chris Gow so much. We discussed it often. Thurston then wrote a song about it. How about that? Which was called Kill Your Idols. How about that? And the very I'll first- that up. The very first line of Kill Your Idols is, oh God, now I'm forgetting it. I don't know why you try to impress Chris Gow. How and about it's specifically that? a line about me. So I've always thought, I've always been very amused by the fact that I inspired, uh, not only inspired a Sonic Youth song, but inspired a fairly, a fairly well-known one. So wow. my point being that you were not alone in terms of downtown New York musicians who uh, had a thorny relationship with or a thorny reaction to Robert Crisco. I just thought he was, you know, he sounds like a great guy, great editor. He just, maybe he just was into like more standard rock and roll or something. I, I, don't, I don't know. know. I never, I, I don't know enough about his personal taste. I mean, or, it wasn't yeah. really, really bad, but it just wasn't, he never was never encouraging for anybody to, to go see us. I, I for my, Thoughts where every time I saw him talk about what's coming this week, it, but what are you going to do? That's the way it is. Everybody's got an opinion, and you know your editor at the Village Voice, you have a big say. Yeah. Thank you for for really in, for doing so much for us as far as getting the word out. What's a, a newspaper that's been forgotten about, but was a big part of our lives at that time was the Soho Weekly News. Okay. Which many of us read as closely as we read the village voice was the soho weekly news more supportive of liquid of liquid liquid? i don't know i i think a little bit more than i think the village voice i think well they did a bit they did an article on us was that the one you did yeah it must was a be. Big yeah you did that one but beyond that i don't i, I don't remember yeah. too much 
It's so it's so funny. I I I'm known for I Dennis. I'm neither a good archivist or have a good memory. So sometimes people say, "Do you remember this article you wrote?" And I don't. Um, I do remember I wrote something about liquid liquid. I don't remember anything about it. I'll send it to you. Please send it to me. I'd love to see it. I I have all these old clips I saved. Like I yeah. I'm not an archivist. I have virtually uh, nothing. <laughs> I plus I have you know rare videos, rare archives. Um, what what is what is in terms of your ability to uh, what's going on with Liquid Liquid's releases and compilations? Well, like right that? now we've had um, actually uh, two, three, three release, three compilations. We had Grand Royal in '97. Then we had um, we had Superior Viaduct reissue right. the, the forty, and then we had Domino in 2008 do a fantastic compilation. And now we're waiting, I guess the next, maybe Domino is going to do another compilation for us. We're waiting to hear what's next there. So that's probably so it for on, a while. on streaming services and in stores, uh, the music is available. Uh, I don't know if it's, it's that much available. Maybe on, I don't think so as much. I mean, you'd probably, probably could go on eBay or go on maybe Amazon and pay a lot of money for these compilations or especially the domino. But I don't know if they're readily available anymore. Mm -hmm. I haven't really checked. I mean, cause I know that, you know, the music of that my band made, we made two records, two albums. Hugo Largo has been largely unavailable for 10 or 15 years. However, relatively soon, it's going to be coming back into visibility. Oh, great. Yeah. I got to hear this music. Well, what what kind of uh, sound was it? It was. Um, we've been called the Godfathers of Slowcore. I don't quite know what that means. We were two bass guitars and a violin and a woman singer. Wow, that's and a great we lineup. Played sort of, I think, kind of like you guys did. We did strange but familiar. It wasn't dissonant or anything. It was mm. very sort of melodic, but very artistic, pointillistic, but also sort of luxurious music. Um, like Liquid Liquid, it, it was, I think, fairly difficult to describe. And fairly at the time, we had certain influences. I think I was influenced by you guys. I was influenced by uh, Young Marble Giants. Oh, I remember um, I was probably influenced by Pill, but my idea at the time I was forming the band in 1983 and 84, my idea was I was very inspired by the Lower East Side noise bands like Swans and Sonic Youth and Live Skull. Mm. And I was very inspired by you guys. And I wanted to take that sound and do something very delicate. Okay. And so I, we did that and, uh, and then two fairly well-known musicians in 1986 and 87 and 88, two fairly well-known musicians, Michael Stipe and Brian Eno. How about um, that? Wow. Took us, took us under their wing. Wow, that's and fantastic. Helped, and helped us with our music and helped us release our music. But it's been out of print for a long time. Now it's coming back into print sometime in 2005. And I'm very happy, about, 2025. And I'm very happy about that. I would love to talk to Thurston Moore, Rick Rubin, but probably kind of difficult to get a hold of, of these kind of guys. Yeah. Well, as you expand the footprint of the uh, the podcast, maybe that will become more uh, more possible. Right. Well, I, I want to. I'm going to keep doing it. I have a lot more people lined up, and it's just um, it's kind of like I'm into it now, and that's why I'm trying to book as many people as I can while I'm still. You know, psyched to do it. Great. And, and it's been fun because I've been able to talk to you and everybody involved with music, and I never knew their backstories. And uh, Primitive Substance is also me, Ray Bally, who also played in the 80s, and this gentleman, Brad Kleiman. So we have like a collective. We play music together and we do different things with each other. And then as far as shows, and then we form this channel. And I've just been taking the lead on it lately because uh, I think there's a need to hear everybody what how they felt in that era because it was so special. 
where is um where have you been performing and how would you describe your music well my music is uh well there's some tribal sounds in it um uh, me- a lot of melody i play moog now i'm playing i'm not playing as much percussion anymore uh, a lot of keyboards i've been playing so a lot of my solo music was all like electronic music uh, even when Liquid Liquid was happening, right. I was doing home recordings. And I've released five, it's called Real to Real ta- uh, releases on Bandcamp that are from two track tapes. And I was just recording myself uh, as I went along. While the band was happening, I would go home and do this experimental music on my own. So luckily I saved the, the, the tapes and then I had to buy another reel to reel like six or seven years ago and transferred it. Uh, but I've been continuing to do music since the band. Right. So, but it's not the same. It's different. Well, a collaboration like a band, especially when you're in your twenties or thirties, um, there's a certain energy to it, which is hard. Well, which I would say is hard to recreate when you get older, but your energy just gets channeled into other things. And and the thing too about Liquid Liquid, we uh, we played our first reunion show at the Knitting Factory uh, in 2003. And before that, uh, we hadn't played in I'd say 20 years as a you know the four piece version because we did have the three piece version of Liquid Liquid for a little bit, but you know that kind of fizzled out. But the minute we started playing in practice, that first I knew it was something special again. Right. It really was f- um, unbelievable. It was something other than just Dennis Young being a marimba player or right. <laughs> Richard being a bass player or Scott or Sal. It all it just was this thing. Well, that's the thing. It's like bands take on. It's the same thing when you write, for instance. If you're a writer, sometimes you're writing something, and the piece you're writing takes on its own identity. Bands are not for people. Bands. You put I, these four people in a room, and if they they form their own, a fifth person in it. If there's a four person band, a fifth person. Right. If there's a four person band, a fifth person enters the room, and that's the that's the band. Right. I yeah. never felt that until that moment. Right. When we that first note, the first minute, it was like, holy smoke, we yeah. we're still the same guys playing this incredible music. Right. So that was something I've never told anybody but you, but that's my feeling that I had. Well, that's, as I said, it's like, it's the four of you and then a fifth person enters. And that fifth person is liquid, liquid. Right. It's not the four of you, the four of you individually. The fifth, it's this whole identity is something apart from the four of you, made up of the four of you, but apart from the four of you. Now I have some, some, um, Music I can send you some compilations if you want. Please do yeah. after after this uh, broadcast. Sure. Uh, send me your address and I'll send you one a bunch of things. I really want to want to make sure you get it because we really appreciate it. Well, Tim, what you did like, for us. You know, I tell anyone I can, and I'd like anyone, if anyone's, you know, the people engaging in this podcast probably already know this, is that. You know, Liquid Liquid were one of the very, very best bands ever to come out of New York. And certainly they had a distinctive invention and creativity that I think drew from everything that was in New York City in the early 1980s. I agree. And somehow it takes a little piece of it. You could probably tell, if not the whole story, of New York City's creative engine in the early 1980s, if not the whole story, a big part of it, just by branching out from what Liquid Liquid were doing and the people you were involved with and the people you inspired. Right. Well, we met some interesting people. We we had a show with the Talking Heads. Right. Because Ed knew Ed knew David Byrne, and and I think he knew Keith Levine from Pill because she was on the Vivian Goldman right. record. That's and right. so Ed had a lot of people coming in the store because uh, I recently hooked up with Bill Ballman. I hadn't seen him in 40 years. I had lunch with him, and he told me stories of everybody coming in to the store, 
seeing Ed and hearing music. Ed would get these imports from England. Right. It's like to be the first store to get it. And I think also I heard That's right, yeah. before us, the metal box too, I heard that he was one of the first to get that record in. Well, it was really, it was without any doubt one of the best, it was one of the best record stores that I'd ever been to. And I, I felt like home. And I was there at least two days a week hmm. during the, uh, you know, 1981, 82, it, you know, I, during that period, I was there all the time. Uh, it felt like home. And I know it was also, and I've only found this out recently because of other work that I've been doing that uh, it had a, Gina had a pretty powerful influence on fashion in, in the area as well. No, I'm, oh, wow, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, because Gina Franklin was there on the other half of the store. Yeah. So she was involved with that. And then also when the song Cavern, Optimo, that last record, Ed had a big, big influence in that. He actually really set up for Cavern. He was really the producer of that to get the arrangement right, to do everything to make it sound like, because he had a, he had a real, he knew the clubs, he knew what, what was going to be played. Right. That's what the genius of Ed was. Right. You know, he just had that sixth sense of what, and then that's how we got in that whole dance circuit, which was really unusual. Right. We never expected that. That was amazing. Playing the Paradise Garage with Chaka Khan. Yeah. Now, what, what's the chances of that, right? I mean, thinking about it now, when we started out, we had we were just going to play those local clubs. But you know, thanks to, as I said, being lucky, right place at the right time, New York, uh, 99 Records, everything sort of fell into place. Right. I mean, now I don't know what would have happened if we played now. Maybe there'd still be influence, but I don't, I don't think like that. I think we were just, there's a lot, there's a lot of luck goes involved too, not only just unique playing. Right. So you did something with, uh, I saw on, on it somewhere, you did something with Hootie and the Blowfish? Yeah, after, uh, in the 1980s, uh, I worked as a writer and a producer and occasionally an on-air person with both MTV and VH1. Oh, and I wow. Put together, and then between 1984 and 89, I did a lot of work with my band, Yugo Largo. Um, in the early 1990s, uh, Danny Goldberg, who's a very leg a legendary figure in the music industry, right? Um, Danny went to work at Atlantic Records on the West Coast, and Danny asked me to come join him and work as an A and R person. Um, I think Danny knew that I knew I had good credibility with alternative music. And I knew had good relationships with a lot of alternative music people. I think Danny thought or hoped that I would bring in alternative music people, um, and I did. There were some. There's some that I did bring into the label, but the first band that I signed to Atlantic was Hootie and the Blowfish. How about that? Um, who were unknown at that time. They were, and no one else wanted to sign them. It wasn't. It was the height of the grunge era. In 1993, oh. it was the height of the grunge era. No one was looking for bands like Hootie and the Blowfish or Dave Matthews Band or any of these sort of, sort of like pop, southernish, acoustic, traditional REM type pop bands. And remember that Hootie's primary influence was always REM. Um, hmm. So anyway, in 1993, in August of 1993, I saw Hootie and the Blowfish play in a club in Columbia, South Carolina. Actually, the club I saw him in was Charleston, South Carolina. And I knew right away that I wanted to work with them, not because no. I thought they were going to be an enormous band, but because I really loved that type of, you know, R.E.M. pop music, which they were playing. Um, and uh, Atlantic said, yeah, you can do this, but it's uh, we need you to do it in we don't have high hopes for this band, so it needs to be an extremely cheap deal. So that's what I did, is I signed Hootie and the Blowfish to Atlantic and then a &R'd their first three records with Atlantic, including their first one, 
Cracked Review, which went on to become, which we made for nothing. We made Cracked Review for $35,000, which in terms of a major label budget in 1994, 93, 94, a major label budget of $35,000 was nothing. Oh, people, I were making sure. rec- people were making records for half a million dollars, quarter million dollars. We made Cracked Review for 35000 and it went on to become the biggest selling record in Atlantic Records history. And wow. How as of now, that? this could have changed. As of, the last time I checked, it was the 11th biggest selling record of all time. When I saw that, I was like, wow, yeah. I never knew that. I, I looked up you know, your bio or on, well, I'll, tell you and- so, I'll tell you something about Hootie and the Blowfish. And this is an important thing, I think, to get across. It was an extraordinary confluence when the nicest band you ever met became the biggest band you ever knew. How about that? That doesn't usually happen. No, no. Because the four guys in Hootie were the nicest band I'd ever met. And very much like with Liquid Liquid, like many other people we know, they made music for the right reasons. They were making music because they loved, they came from the same college rock era that I came from. And they were very into sort of obscure college rock. Uh, And as I said, their primary influence is R.E.M., um, and they were just, they were doing music for the right reasons. And they, when we were making, when we were making their first album, we hoped and dreamed that it would sell 50,000 copies. That was wow. really their goal to sell 50,000 hmm. records. Wow. And that didn't happen. They ended up selling the last time I checked 20, 25 million. Oh my gosh. Um, wow. I so, know they were huge. Yeah. And but again, I want to stress that of all the people that I've ever met, who do you like you guys, like so many of the people that we knew in the early and mid-1980s, they were making music for the right reasons. It just so happened that they became enormous. And they would have made it, keep in mind, and this is a very remarkable thing about Hootie, that not a lot of people realize. I signed them in 1993. That's when I first saw them, and then when I, that's when I signed them to Atlantic. They had already been together and playing eight years by that time. Holy smoke. They've been playing since 1985. Wow. Never expected the kind of success that they achieved. Wow, that's amazing. Because we, we were not together that long. I mean, there was uh, the liquid idiot phase in right. New York, but we were not together that long before you know it, it took off. I think you know, the success of Hootie and the Blowfish is a reflection of the enormous influence R.E.M. had on an entire generation of, uh, of bands, specifically sort of like just guys listening to R.E.M. Because this is what happened with Hootie and the Blowfish. These were guys who just worshipped R.E.M. and said, we want to play music like that. And they got together in their college dorm and they did it. And yep. then eight years later, they signed to Atlantic Records. And then they made a record that really seemed to reach, touch a lot of people and reach something about, you know, what America needed in 1994, 95, 96. Now, what, uh, did you see any of our reunion shows at all? No, and I'm sorry I didn't. That's too bad. Yeah. I have some clips of it. I'll I'll send you also. Yeah, please do. Please do. Yeah, it's too bad. Um, One of our, the last show we did was at uh, Madison Square Garden with LCD, sound system. But that's a long story, and I don't want to get negative here, so I'll, I'll leave that someday I'll, I'll, for another time. But it was uh, a good and bad experience for me, anyway. Um, the show itself or the reunion in general? Uh, no, the uh, being an opening act at right. Madison Square Garden is never an easy, easy thing. Uh, the union, and we had to right. we had to go on exactly at eight o'clock. They told us there, uh, so we only, people were still coming in. Right. Uh, our sound check was shortchanged. So, you know, it, for, for me, it was, it was a fantastic to play there, but I, I kind of wish we ended all of this at maybe a place where people wanted to just see us. Well, maybe you'll still have that chance. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. There's a slight chance, but that I don't know. As time goes on seems to get less and less possible, but that's okay. You know, we, we, 
it's, it's no big deal. We we went to Japan on the reunion shows. We went to Spain, uh, Germany, Paris. So it was fantastic. So yeah. I, I can't complain. And the energy of that reunion shows were just incredible. It's too bad we never, we, we did some recording, but they haven't come out yet. So yeah, we'll see what happens. The only song that ever, that's ever come out from all that was Bellhead that uh, DFA reissued. Right. They did a, they recorded it and did a, a mix of it. Right. But other than that, so it's okay. I mean, I, I'm not, I can't, it is what it is, but yeah. I, so I'm trying to think of anything else. I don't know anything else you want to talk about. I well, mean, you can we always know, and then you can always do a part two. If let's you do want. another one. Yeah. That'd be great. And, yeah, uh, and I think I just, I want to emphasize that, you know, we were coming in 1981, 82. We were coming, New York City was this place where urban music, rap, the graffiti culture, hardcore punk music, downtown extreme noise rock. Right. Uh, like Glenn Branca, who I played with Glenn Branca for a few years. Oh, I was in the Glenn Branca did. Ensemble. I didn't know that. Yeah, from 1983 through 1986. Was he, um, was he a hard guy to get to know? or? I don't, I don't think any, I made no, you know, I don't think you knew him. You just listened to him and respected him because he's a genius. I mean, I oh, think he was. Him. Absolutely. Without him, there would be no Sonic Youth. There would be no Swans. I'm not sure there would have been, you know, I think his influence on New York is profound. Um, but, you know, what I was just trying to say to, 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 to wrap this up is that. Sure. So in... In the early 1980s, you had all of these elements, extreme noise rock, hardcore punk, the graffiti culture, rap music, the rap culture, the extraordinary things that were coming in largely via import from England, all right. of that coming together in downtown New York. For me, the center of that was 99 Records on McDougal Street, on 99 McDougal Street. And... Therefore, I think it is all typified and exemplified in that little extraordinary label that had Liquid Liquid, that had ESG, that had Rick Rubin's first band, Hose. Right. All of this coming together in this little store. Yeah, it was amazing. an extraordinary time. And I think what 99 Records was doing and what you were part of typifies this amazing mix, this, this, this you know gumbo of cultures that was coming together in downtown New York in the very wow. early 1980s. It was coming together in that store on your records. Wow. Well, that couldn't have been put any better than that. I mean, you really summed it up like uh, you're right. Wow. Yeah. And I think that's something that everything we can do to draw attention to that would be wonderful. Now, was there any way... The audience here can get in touch with you on your writings or any of your like um, put in. Uh, like most put in. of my writing these days is on a website called uh, on a site called the Rock and Roll Globe. Rock That's roll, the okay. Rock and Roll Globe. Um, okay. And I wrote a book about two years ago on my experiences with Hootie and the Blowfish. Oh, That's I didn't called, know that. Uh, Only want to be with you: the inside story of Hootie and the Blowfish. Interestingly wow. enough, that's just come out in paperback. Um. So between the Rock and Roll Globe and what's available uh, on that book, and I'm going to have another book coming out next year, specifically on the teenage punk rock culture in New York City in the late 1970s. Wow. And yeah. then well, that's so, great. You know, this is a, I think this is a very fascinating subject. You know, all of these things coming together and who knows. So that's where I think people can, can find out what I'm doing. And certainly the Rock and Roll Globe, if you just put okay. in my name, is a great place to see what I write about. Great. Well, you know, I can't thank you enough, Tim. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm you happy to been, do this again, Dennis, if you want. I, I would love to, and I'm glad I started these podcasts. To, I am too. To, to meet people like you who, you know, were, were a fan, but you also loved everything going yeah. on. You had the whole feel of that that scene, that well, whole, whole scene. Thank you. And, and, and it's good to, you know, you were such a large part, a part of it, so... Any chance I get to discuss this, and I'm happy to do it again. Okay, great. Let's do it again, and we'll we'll dive on another subject. And 
You never know. I might get Rick Rubin on. Who knows? Yeah. All right. Kirsten, yeah. Keep Take on care, Tim. Around. Okay, be well. Take care. Bye-bye.